Oasis Church. My name is Ken. I'm one of the pastors here. And uh, you are all joining us today online. We uh, have the church itself, the building closed. Uh, that is because my wife uh, on Saturday came down with several of the symptoms of the COVID-19. Uh, she has no taste, no smell, uh, some tightness in her chest, and uh, she is growing uh, and more and more fatigued. So if you could be in prayer for her, we would appreciate that. Um, she should have her test results back by Wednesday or Thursday. But in the meantime, uh, I and my kids are going to have to be quarantined with her. She is isolated in a different room of the house. Um, but we wanted to record this and get this out uh, so that we are still able to worship in the word. Um, we are not going to have a time of singing today, uh, but there will be a, a time of, of preaching and hearing the word. And I pray that that will be a blessing to you. A uh, few quick announcements before we get started. Um, we uh, want you to go ahead and share this video on your Facebook feed, or if you're watching this on YouTube, you can copy the link and you can send that out to others. You can uh, text it to somebody in, on your phone. You can share it on your Facebook feed. Uh, you can send it as a, in a message. We want to get the gospel out to as many people as possible. So please uh, do that. Please help us by being a digital missionary in this very strange time that is uh, one of the most uh, uh, valuable tools that we have to get the gospel out. So please do that now. Uh, we also want to encourage all of our uh, Warsaw Baptist Church family, whether that's members or longtime visitors, longtime watchers, if you are uh, considering yourself a part of Warsaw Baptist Church, remember that, that we do count on your tithes and offerings to make this ministry uh, work, make this ministry uh, viable. And uh, we would encourage you to go ahead and uh, make your tithe or offering online. Uh, that is the easiest way to do that. Uh, you can do that by going to warsawbaptist.com slash giving and just hit the donate button. I think if you just go to warsawbaptist.com and scroll down to the bottom of the page, there should be a donate button on the bottom there and you can do that. It goes through PayPal. It's a very easy way to do it. If you are still someone who likes to send in a check, uh, you can do that by sending it to Warsaw Baptist Church, P.O. Box 846, and the zip code here in Warsaw, Kentucky is 41095. Uh, again, thank you very much for all of you who have continued to be faithful, giving members of this church to make this happen. Uh, obviously, with the, the year being what it has been and, and many people being out of work or getting a lot less hours, we have seen a dip in our giving. Uh, so hopefully uh, those who are still able to work are still able to give and, and make up for that dip. Uh, but, uh, but we're just relying on Christ to, uh, to, to guide us and to guide our giving. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, on the same track when we're talking about giving, this is Missions Month at Warsaw Baptist Church. Uh, we are a Southern Baptist Convention church, and uh, we are a part of a sending organization called the International Mission Board. And the International Mission Board has been sending missionaries out for 175 years to the farthest reaches of the earth, uh, going and planting churches, going and translating the scriptures into many different languages, going out, uh, as God has called us to do, to go and make disciples of all nations. Um, part of that includes sacrifice. And uh, this video that we're going to watch in just a minute uh, just details some of the people over the last 175 years who have given their lives for the mission of Christ in this uh, global field. Um, so uh, we are going to watch that video, but I would also encourage you, um, prepare in your heart how much you would like to give to the International Mission Board. We'll have envelopes like these uh, put in the pews on the weekend right after Christmas on that Sunday, we'll collect any uh, mission giving that you want to do in person. Uh, but again, just like our online giving for the church, it is much easier for you and better for, for them if you can just go to imb.org slash 
uh, lottie-moon-christmas-offering. Uh, we should have links to that and our giving page uh, in the comments thread of this video. But um, go ahead and s you can donate right now to the International Mission Board if you want to do that and then get back to the video here. Um, but we're going to watch a quick video uh, just giving honor and uh, recognition to the many uh, brothers and sisters who have given their all, given their entire lives um, for the mission of, of spreading this gospel. Uh, the message will be right after the video, and I hope you can tune in. And again, please share this video with as many people as you can so that the gospel can go out. Uh, hopefully, I'll be seeing uh, quite a few uh, people watching this live, and then uh, hopefully I'll see a lot of shares so that, uh, that we can uh, just get the gospel into as many hearts as possible. So watch this quick video, and then we'll get into the message. God bless you. For 175 years, God has given life to this organization. He has called us to go. Thousands have answered that call and Southern Baptists have joined together to send them. From every walk of life, from every part of our country, they boarded ships and planes, leaving behind all that was comfortable, predictable, safe and secure. All to go and share the good news of Jesus Christ. Into deserts and jungles, across mountains and seas, they planted their lives preaching Christ crucified. Many completed their service and came back to their homeland, but some did not. Some would perish on the field. They would starve, become ill, or be struck down on distant and dangerous roads to present the gospel. And some would be struck down for simply preaching the good news of Christ. In moments of extreme violence, many would choose to stay in danger to bring peace to those in the midst of chaos. Those are dark days for all of us, when we lose our brothers and sisters, when we feel the very real sting of death. On those days, we all ask, is it worth it? Is it worth the high price, the ultimate price? Etched on the hearts of missionaries throughout time are words like these. My life is of no value. My aim is to finish the race. To live is Christ and to die is gain. So we take up our cross to be living sacrifices. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friend. These lives were not lost. These lives were given. We may never know the full impact these missionaries have given on this side of eternity, but some stories we do know. Stories of God pouring out His Spirit on tribes and nations because missionaries model the one true sacrifice. Generations, forever altered. Life is a gift. How will you use the life you've been given?
All right, so now we're going to get into a time of the word, and I, uh, I just thank you for your patience and your understanding with this format. Um, we have a lot of our members who have not been able to be in this building uh, for the entire time that COVID has been going on uh, because of their health risks, and uh, we just want to, uh, to, 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 to carry that burden with them this week. And uh, if you are uncomfortable with this, just imagine what it's been like for them uh, to not be able to gather with the saints for months now. Uh, we are 10 months into this, and, uh, and it's, been, it's been hard on all of us, but especially on those who have had to be homebound for this entire time for different reasons. Uh, so uh, as we go into this message, this is the second in a, in a series for Missions Month. And last week we talked about going and just planting a mustard seed. Remember, it was just the next little thing that you're supposed to be doing, the next cup of coffee, the next conversation, the next thing that you do with gospel intentionality. That's how we go and make disciples. And today we're going to talk about going as a grain of wheat. And you'll see what I'm talking about in just a second. Uh, but I'm going to read a, a short piece of scripture. Uh, because of the technical issues today, we won't be able to put it on the screen. But hopefully you have a Bible open in front of you. If not, you can go ahead and do that right now. And uh, just pause this and go get the Bible. Uh, and now uh, we're going to read it together. And uh, again, I'm going to be in John chapter 12, verses 23 through 26. I'll read it, and then we'll pray, and then we'll get into the word. Father God, thank you for this word. In John chapter 12, in verses 23 through 26, it says this, And Jesus answered them, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, Jesus says, if anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there he will be my servant also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father God, I pray that you will do the supernatural work that has to be done for the, the gap to be bridged between my speaking here in an empty room to uh, those who are listening on phones and tablets and televisions. I pray that you would do the work to, to bridge that gap. Holy Spirit, I pray that my words would not go out void, that you would uh, infuse them with your power, with, that you would anoint this time with your power and your might and your resolve. And Lord, I pray that this would be a message that even in this odd circumstance, you would use for your glory and for the pushing out of the kingdom of God into all the dark places of the world. Lord, that will not happen without your prompting in our hearts. That will not happen without our submission to your calling. Lord, let it be so. Let it be done. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, so again, this is Missions Month, and this, uh, this is all leading up to our giving time for the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. Uh, we have a goal of $500. It is not a huge goal compared to all of the need that they have. Uh, but it is, we are just one mustard seed church. Uh, and as we give and other little churches give and some very large churches give very large amounts, we are funding the work of God's mission going out. Uh, and, and as we think about the missionaries that are a part of the International Mission Board, the ones who are trained up and sent out, uh, I don't want you to lose the, the thought. I don't want you to lose the idea. I don't want you to be unaware or ignorant of the fact that if you are a Christian, you are a missionary too. You may never go overseas. You might. But whether you do or not, you are a missionary if you are a Christian. If you are a Christian, you are going across the globe or across the street. 
If you are a Christian, you are sending and supplying both prayer supply and financial supply. You are supplying the missionaries who are going across the world. You are supplying the, the, the church planters who are, who are going across the globe and, and even across this country. Uh, we uh, are, are, are helping with a church plant in Indianapolis. Your giving helps us to help them to go as missionaries, as church planters into Indianapolis and to spread the gospel. Uh, you are, as a Christian, a part of this missionary work as you pray for personal direction, as you pray saying, Lord, what do you want me to say? And who do you want me to say it to? How do you want to use me for the mission? You pray for that, but you also pray, Lord, please give me the empowerment to go where you call me to do. Please give me the courage to go and say what you want me to say. And then you also pray for the missionaries who are going farther away. Uh, we have a lot of people in our church who are young families. And you might say, well, we're a young family. We, we, we have to really be concerned with what we're doing right here. God might call you, young family, to the mission field, to overseas missions, where you have to learn a new language, where you have to go into an uncomfortable area and go and be a missionary. We have several people in our church who are retirees. And, and I know that time with the grandkids is a wonderful luxury that, that you have worked hard to, to have time to do. But you might be called out of that comfort zone, out of that you know, grandparent time to go somewhere where someone has never heard the gospel. And I pray that you would be praying, Lord, is that me? Is that what you want me to do? I, I was talking to a, a brother who is planting a, a church in Madison, Indiana, where I, I came from. And, uh, and, and he and I were having lunch this week, and, and it was just amazing to see how God providentially placed his, his, his relationships and his steps so that he ended up back in Madison. He really didn't think he was going to be in Madison. He thought he was going to be in California or somewhere else. And God brought him right back here. So uh, we just pray, Lord, where do you want us to go? And then you, we submit to where he says to go. That might be to your neighbor. It might be to the guy on the next line at work. It might be, you know, to a, a long lost, estranged family member that you just have never had anything to do with for years because of something that was said or done, you are going to be sent. You just need to pray, Lord, where, to who, and how. And then you need to go. So as we get into this message, as we look at the text that I read just a minute ago in the Gospel of John, I want to ask this question. What do you think is the biggest obstacle to the missions movement? If you're watching this online, you could, you could even type it in the comment thread. What do you think, Christian, is the biggest obstacle to the missionary movement in the West, in America, in Warsaw, today? What do you think is the biggest obstacle? Uh, the reason I ask that is because there are 2.5 billion Christians by the latest, you know, tally... 2.5 billion Christians in the world. And there are only 7,414 unreached people groups. 2.5 billion people versus 7,000 and some change people groups. It doesn't seem like that should take too much effort. It should be just... An amazing swamp of numbers just saying, okay, we'll just saturate those 7,000 people with the good news. We've got 2.5 billion people. Why do you think it's not happening? Why do you think we've been on that line of six to 7,000 people groups for years now? Why do you think we have not finally gotten over the edge and gotten the word out to every nation? What do you think is the biggest obstacle? That's my question as we look 
in here. Do you think it's funding? Is, is it possible that we just don't have enough money to reach them? Do, do you think it's a, a lack of education? Maybe we don't have enough Christians who are educated and, and know enough about the gospel to, to go and share it? Do you think the problem might be uh, government obstacles? We know that in some of these uh, other countries, the, the governments are very hostile to the, to the gospel. That's true in large countries like, like China. It's also true in smaller countries all throughout the world. Do you think it's government interference that's the problem? What do you think is the biggest obstacle to the missions movement today? Do you think it's maybe family obligations? Do you think maybe it's, well, I would go, but who would take care of my mom? I would go, but who would take care of my grandkids? I would go, but fill in the blank with family obligations. Do you think it's, it's, it's denominational strife? We have thousands of denominations. My friend who's planting in Madison is part of the Reformed Church. We are a Baptist church. Uh, we have a community church that meets in this same building. We have a Methodist church down the street. Is it because there's so many denominations? Do you think that is throwing a clog in the system and that's why we are not as effective as we need to be? Is that why 2.5 billion Christians can't reach 7,000 people groups? Do you think it's persecution? Do you think it's because we have stories like we just watched in that video? People who have, who have died at the hands of hostile persecution? What do you think is the, the number one reason we don't have effective missions to the point that we can reach these last 7,000 peoples with 2.5 billion Christians on earth? Why do you think it's happening? I would say it's none of those reasons that I listed. I, I would say that funding is not the issue because because we've seen in the history of the church, the, the church went out when there was no money. Remember? The, the, the church in Acts had nothing. They had to pool their resources together because, because they just didn't have much of anything. A lot of people were being saved into this church and there was just nothing to eat. So they had to sell what they had and they had to pull this money together so that they could just feed each other. But the, the church exploded from there for generations it kept growing so i don't think it's funding i don't think it's uh, a lack of education the the early apostles they 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 didn't have a seminary degree a college a bible college degree they didn't have a bunch of education in fact that was one of the things that the enemies of the early church remarked on who are these uneducated men I don't think education is the issue. I don't think gov government obstacles can be used as an excuse for why we are not as powerful as missionaries as we could be. Because again, look at the early church. If you want to talk about government obstacles, look at the early church. To say Jesus Christ is Christ, is the king, is the only authority in my life. And Caesar isn't it. That could mean instant death or isolation for a Christian. And yet the church continued to grow under that kind of government obstacles. Family obligations. Jesus, when he was on his mission, had family who did not understand. And he finally had to say, listen, if you are going to follow me, you're going to have to love me more than brothers, sisters, fathers, mothers, children. Family cannot be the thing that we use as an excuse not to go reach the lost. Your family has had an opportunity, I hope, to hear the gospel. But there are people out there dying every day and going to hell because no one has told them. 
I would say this scripture today shows us what the biggest obstacle is to the gospel. The biggest obstacle to the gospel, there's one lesser obstacle, which I think is very important that we'll look at. But then there's one major obstacle to the gospel, to the mission of getting this message out to that, those last 7,000 people groups. This is what I think it is. Let's look at the text again. First, let's look at uh, John chapter 12, verse 23. It says, And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. What do I think is one of the greatest obstacles? Not family obligations, not government obstacles, not financing, not education. It's a lack of urgency. That's one of the chief problems of the missionary movement today is there's no lack of urgency. There's no understanding that this is all about to be done. I'm not talking about this is all about to be done like maybe Jesus is going to come back tomorrow. He could, but that's not even what I'm talking about. I'm talking about if Jesus tarries for another 2,000 years, this is all about to be done for people you know who are not going to make it through 2021. This is about to be done for, genera for a whole generation of people who are on their way out of this life. This is all about to be done. Jesus said, listen, you've been with me for these three years, but now the hour has come. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Then he was talking about the crucifixion is about to come. The crucifixion, the resurrection, and the ascension into heaven is about to come. The hour has come for the Son of Man, for Jesus, to be glorified. That's what it meant then when he said it in John chapter 12. And since then, and right now, the hour has come for us to reflect the radiance, the glorious light of Jesus' glory into a dark and hurting world. Now the hour is here for us to glorify Jesus. Yes, maybe the second coming is going to be right around the corner, but right now people are dying in the hospital. Right now people are wondering whether they want to go on for another day. Right now people are struggling to know how they're going to make it through the next month. They need the good news now. They need to have the glory of God shine into their lives right now. There's a lack of urgency. That is one of the reasons that we are so impotent in gospel power as missionaries. Because we don't have a lack of a, a sense of urgency. We lack a sense of urgency. One of the greatest obstacles is we don't feel the immediate need. If people don't know to glorify God for his mercy before they die. Listen, if the people you love who don't know Jesus, if they don't know that they can glorify God for his astounding mercy before they die, then after they take that last breath, then they will glorify God for his perfect justice. Is there urgency? Is there urgency in our hearts for those who don't know yet? Maybe you've shared the gospel and you have been denied any hearing from people you love. Listen, there's urgency for the next ones. The Bible says if they won't listen, shake off the dust from your feet and go because there's still others who haven't heard. And they need to hear now. They need to hear the gospel now. Do you have a sense of urgency? Do you understand eternity is at stake for the people we know, the people we love, even the people we don't love? I say that was one of the obstacles. But I think Jesus shows us the biggest obstacle in the text today. Let's look at the biggest obstacle to the missionary movement in this world. 
Look at verses 24 through 26. This is Jesus talking. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. What is the biggest obstacle? It's this. We're not willing to die to ourselves, to our desires, to the things we want so that others might hear. See, his death was this picture of Jesus, was this kernel, this grain of wheat put into the ground and died, but then it grew. And you, if you're a Christian, you are a part of that harvest, that plentiful harvest. You are a part of that. But you are another seed. If you're a Christian, you are another wheat kernel, a grain of wheat. And so many of us have so wanted to protect ourselves as these individual kernels of wheat and in individual grains that we've shut ourselves up. And Jesus says the problem with that is if that doesn't go into the earth and die, it remains alone, alone. You are a lonely grain of wheat. The biggest obstacle is we're not willing to allow ourselves to be planted in the ground. We're not willing to allow ourselves to die to the comforts of this world, to die to the uh, high opinion of outsiders. We're not willing to die to these things. And so we have no fruit. The biggest obstacle is, is this lack of self-denial. According to Jesus. See, in verse 24, Jesus is talking about himself going to the cross. Jesus had everything. He didn't need to do anything. But because he wanted to see the fruit of the church spring up, he allowed himself to go and die. You and I deserve to die. You and I have sinned against a holy God. We deserve death. We deserve hell. But he didn't. But because he wanted to save us, wanted to save you into this kingdom, he went to the cross and he gave his life. He was that grain of wheat. And his blood was the, was the, the, the saturating moisture that helped us grow. He went to the cross. And then just like the grain starts to sprout out of the ground, he came out of the tomb. And he ascended to the right hand of the Father and he sent the Spirit so that you would be given the ability to believe in what he had done. And the Spirit gave you life and made you a part of this wheat field, a part of this family, a part of this church, the global church that has been going for 2,000 years across the world but still has to reach 7,000 people groups. His death Burial, resurrection, and ascension has produced this amazing field of 2.5 billion Christians, including you, if you're a Christian. But if we don't plant ourselves in the ground, if we don't say, Lord, I don't think you want all of us to, to die like the missionaries we watched in the video, but I know there's things we need to die too. So that we can be effective in this, in this call. Now this may be overstated. To some of you. Some of you might say Ken I, I, I really do not think it's as serious as all that. Peter thought so. Peter thought that. 
He said, I don't know if we all need to die. I don't think Jesus even needs to die, Peter would say. Peter had this same idea that maybe you're having. Maybe you're saying, Ken, you're getting way too worked up about this. God is sovereign. He's going to save his people. I don't think we all have to die to something. That's what Peter thought. Let me read what Peter said when, when he heard this same message from Jesus earlier on in the ministry of Jesus. Peter says in Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8 verses 31 through 32. Jesus is talking about having to die. This is Peter's response. He, Jesus, began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. So he's saying here, in just another way, he's saying, like this grain of wheat, I'm going to have to be buried. I'm going to have to die. But in three days, I'm going to rise. Now, Peter hears this. Jesus, it says, said it very plainly so that there was no mistaking. This is going to have to happen. There will have to be self-denial for the church to grow, for people to be reached, for people to be rescued from hell. This is going to be hard. There will be dying to self. There will be self-denial. This is not up for negotiation. Jesus says this. He makes it clear. He says it plainly. And this is how Peter took it. it. says, Peter took him aside, took Jesus aside, took his rabbi, his teacher, his Lord, who he had just confessed to be the Christ, the Messiah. He took him, he took Jesus aside and began to rebuke Jesus. Verse 33 says, but turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter. See, Peter looked at what Jesus was saying and says, no, 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 no. That's not how it's going to happen. You are the Messiah. That means you are the king. That means you are about to overtake Rome. And Jesus says, oh, yeah, I'm going to overtake Rome. I'm going to overtake everything. But not the way you think. Not in the time frame you want. Not in the way you would understand to be best, but in my way. Peter had a problem with God's way and God's time. Sometimes we do too. Especially when we hear that that might instill suffering on our Lord or on us. So here's what Jesus does after he is rebuked by Peter. He rebuked Peter. Jesus rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And then listen, and calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now listen, he said, if anyone would follow him, that means there's not a group of Christians who follow him in self-denial and then a group of Christians who just go and have all the worldly comforts and never struggle. He says, if anyone, if you, if I am going to follow Jesus, if we are to follow Jesus, this is what the road to glory looks like. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and for the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation... Of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Do you hear that? Jesus is saying, if you hold on to this sinful and adulterous generation, 
whether that's their approval of you or the things they offer you, if you will not hold those things in an open hand and say, Lord, what do you want to take so that I can be made into the most productive, on-fire missionary for you? I want to follow you, so I know that means that I'm going to have to have some self-denial. I know that means I'm going to have to carry my cross. And I know that's going to look different for me than it does for my neighbor over here who's also a Christian. I know it's going to look different, but I know it requires some sort of suffering. So let me ask you, forget about what it might mean for the missionaries that we watched on the video. Forget what it might mean for the missionaries who, who you know who are maybe overseas or, or, or maybe they just retired from a, a life on, in the mission field. Think about yourself. Think about your life. Think about what's going on around you. Think about the things that you hold on to tightly. And ask yourself, if this is true, if, this, if Jesus means anyone and I'm on anyone... If he means all of his disciples are going to have to travel this road of self-denial, what do I have to die to to follow him? What's getting in the way of my ability to, to, to share the gospel? Because I won't die to it. Do you need to die or deny the lie that the next trinket is going to make you happy? Do, do you live for the next phone, the next truck, the next gun, the next computer, the next whatever? Do you, do you need to die to the constantly striving for the next thing, the next and just a little bit better thing? Do you need to die to that so that you can focus on what truly brings you joy, which is bringing people to Christ? Or do you think maybe that thing is going to make you happier than bringing somebody to Christ, to saving somebody from hell? Do you need to die to that next thing? Is it material stuff that you need to die and deny? Do you need to die to or deny the need to be approved of or understood by your family and your peers? Now, this is a big one. When I first decided, Lord, I'm going to follow this call. I feel like you're calling me to be a pastor. I had friends from college saw what I, what I was doing and, and begged me not to do this. Begged me not to give up a, a promising career for this. For the pastorate. If my desire was to just be approved of or just to be understood, then I wouldn't be here today. Is there somebody in your life that you care so much about their approval or their understanding your decisions that you wouldn't make a decision if God called you to go across the globe? That you, wouldn't, that you wouldn't want to have that conversation even with them about the true and eternal things because you really just don't want them to disapprove of you. Do you need to die to that? Is that where self-denial has to come in in your life? Do you need to die to or deny the distraction of fleeting things? I understand we're in this COVID time where a lot of us have not been able to really get out and about as much as we'd like. And so we uh, tend to gravitate towards things that are just distracting. Just distract me from the boredom. Just distract me from what's going on and not going on. Do you need to die to those distractions that would uh, just keep your mind on fleeting things that do not matter in the eternal scheme of things? Now, let me define some of the fleeting things so that you can sort of find out if this is you. Do you need to die to politics? I, I mean, I'm, I'm old enough to know that there's this cycle. The liberals get really powerful, and then they jack it up, and then the conservatives get really powerful, and then they jack it up, and then the liberals get real powerful, and it just goes back and forth. 
a cycle of 8 to 12, maybe 20 years, and it'll turn back the other way. But every time you turn on the news, every time you turn on your social media, there's probably somebody telling you that this election or the next election or the last election was the most important one in all of American history. Let me tell you, politics is a fleeting distraction from the things that really matter. Jesus isn't going to quiz you when you get to heaven and say, okay, are, did you vote Republican or Democrat or Libertarian? Did you vote? There's not a, a different section for you in heaven versus the other people on the other side of the aisle. That is a fleeting thing. Do you, do you need to die to the distraction or, the, or, or deny the distraction of sports? I mean, we live in Kentucky. Oh, you live in Kentucky. I know UK is huge, right? One of the good things about COVID is I think it's starting to break some of us loose from the sports addiction. I mean, seriously, if you were to look at your calendar over the last five years and your checkbook ledger from the last five years, have you spent more time and money focused on some kids, 20-year-old kids throwing a ball than you have on the things that matter for eternity? Or are you, just going to step on everybody's toes, are you, by your life, by the choices you make, by the things that you do or don't do, by the way you spend your time, by the way you allocate your resources, are you showing kids that are still in the home that their ability to run fast or jump high or throw a ball is more important than their walk with Christ? Do you need to deny some sports-related nonsense, some fleeting stuff? Do you need to deny climbing that corporate ladder, climbing that career ladder, what do you need to deny that is a fleeting thing in your life? Maybe that's not you. Maybe it's not people's approval. Maybe it's not sports or entertainment or the next video game. Maybe it's, maybe it's not for you chasing after that next material possession. Maybe, maybe you're watching this and you're saying, you know, if, if I'm honest, I need to deny or die to the idolatry of children and grandchildren. Now, don't get me wrong. I love my kids. I hope you love your kids and your grandkids. But sometimes our focus can be so locked in to their cute little faces and making them happy that, again, our time, our resources all go into making this world all about them. And that does a twofold disservice. A, it shows them that they're more important to you than God, which is, which is just bad news. And it also helps them to buy into the idea that they are more important than God. So they see your interest and their worth as higher than the throne of heaven. And you might say, well, no, I would never say that. I bring them to church. Okay. But in your daily life, in the way you talk, in the way you spend, in the way you dote over them or focus on God and lead them to God and bring them to the word and bring them to him, which do you think they would think is more important if you were to ask them? Them or him? Do you need to die to that idolatry of kids? Now, I hope you're following me. I'm not saying that you should get rid of your kids. I'm not saying that you should kick all your grandkids out of the house and never have them around. I'm not saying you should stop watching sports. I'm not saying you should stop playing video games. I'm not saying you should stop buying the next phone. I'm saying, do you need to die to something of that that has become way too prominent in your heart, in your affections, in your desires, in your attention? What do you need to die to? Maybe you need to die to or deny the fear of failure. I hear this all the time as a pastor. Well, 
I couldn't do it because I don't know the right thing to say. What if they ask this question and I don't know the answer? Let me just open the door and let you in. You're going to fail at this. You're going to screw things up as a missionary. You're going to say the wrong thing or maybe say the wrong thing at the wrong time, the right thing at the wrong time. Sometimes you're going to mess this up. I mess it up. Ask anybody who I work with. Sometimes I do not have the, 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 the right word or the right attitude. I just don't. Because I'm not Jesus. I'm going to screw up. You're going to screw up. But here's the beautiful thing. All you have to do is fail forward. Just keep trying. Just keep going. Don't be so paralyzed by the fear of failure that you don't go and, 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 and do something for the kingdom of God. Do you need to die or deny the constraints, the straitjacket of comfort? I mean, I mean, I can't see your hands. You're, you're where you are. Maybe you can hit like if you agree with this. Have you ever watched a video about a missionary who took their five kids and went over to Zimbabwe or something? They're living on some dirt road in a you know, metal shack. And you're just saying, I just, I, I could do that. The comfort that I require just wouldn't allow that. I mean, I'll be honest, I've, I've had the conversation, Lord, if you're going to call me to overseas missions, please call me to a European country with running water that speaks English. Like, I'm just a bad missionary when it comes to that. I need to die. I need, Ken Ritchie needs to die to the constraints of comfort. How about you? Now, I've listed a lot of things. Because there's a lot of different people who might be watching this. I've listened to a lot of things because I know enough people to know some of you don't idolize your grandkids or your kids. You are training them up in the way they should go and you're doing a beautiful job. But maybe you do idolize that next fill in the blank. That next guitar. That next camera. That next whatever. Some of you don't do either of those, but you really do strive for the approval of people instead of striving for the approval of Jesus. See, the beautiful thing about knowing that God's graciousness is for you is that you don't have to work for other people's approval. You're already approved of by Jesus, so who cares what they think? But let me just add one last thing. Paul, when sometimes when he lists a, a group of sins that we need to avoid, he'll say, don't, don't be sexually immoral, don't covet, don't do this, and don't do things like this. So, so maybe you're saying, I don't have any of those things that I have to die to. I'm doing all right. Well, I would say, and things like these at the end, because maybe I didn't mention the thing that you need to die to, but maybe the Holy Spirit's saying it right now. Maybe the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit is saying to you right now, Ken didn't say your thing that you need to die to, but you know what it is. If that's you, take this opportunity to say, I want to die to that. And now listen, I, I know this is, this is, you know, we're leading up to Christmas. This is supposed to be a time when we're doing happy, fun, cheery uh, messages. But listen... There are 7,000 people groups who don't know about Jesus, who are dying and going to hell. But I don't want you to do any of this. I don't want you to deny any part of your life. I don't want you to die to self at all because you feel like you have to. I want you to be invited to do these things because you get to. And there is a promise to those of us who will take God at his word. Look again in John chapter 12. In John chapter 12, verse 24, this is where we'll end. Let me read it again. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, that's what we've been talking about, it remains alone, that's what we don't want. But if it dies, listen to this promise, if it dies, if you die to self, if you deny self, so that you can go and live on mission for him, this is what happens. If it dies, it bears much fruit. 
See, the fatal mistake would be to focus so much on what you need to die to that you forget about the promise. The fatal mistake would be the thing that will stop you from going and making disciples of all the nations, the thing that will stop us from being an effective church, both as a, as a local church or the church globally, the thing that will stop us is if we focus so much on what we need to die to that we forget the promise. That if we do this, this temporary discarding of something for the eternal treasure of Christ and the church, if we hold so hard on to the things that we need to die to that we forget to hold on to the promise, we will, we will, we will rot on the vine. He says, do this. He promises, do this. And you will bear much fruit. So I'm inviting you. Jesus is inviting you. The word is inviting you. The Holy Spirit, I pray, is working ahead of every word I've said today. And he is right now working, inviting you. Close your eyes. Think about it. He's inviting you to die to self so you can plant that next grain. And what we're going to see if we do this, we're going to see churches planted. We're going to see the word translated into ever more languages. We're going to see hurting people healed. We're going to see addicts and alcoholics rescued from the slavery of the bottle in those substances. We're going to see missionaries sent. And we're going to see missionaries equipped. And we're going to see people saved to the glory of God. Listen, that is the treasure. That is the treasure. When we get to heaven, our treasure is Jesus and those that we brought along with us. Paul says that the joy and the, 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 the jewels in his crown are the people who came to Christ because of his mission, because of his ministry. You if you're a Christian, have a mission. You have a ministry. There are people waiting to hear the gospel from your lips. And when you get to heaven, when we get to heaven, we will see each other and we will rejoice. Because we died momentarily to some little piddly thing in this world. And then we all get to live forever with everything. Jesus, for the joy set before him, put everything down so that he could save you, so that he could save me. Let's do the same thing. Let's give everything away so that we can get the universe. Let's pray. Father God, we are in strange times. Father, we are in a current crisis with the COVID, but, but we, have, we have been thrown off our bearings. We have been thrown off our mission so long before that virus started to spread. We were already sickened by the worldly pursuits. We were already sickened by the things that this world tells us we need to find as important and vital. And Lord, we have, we have done amazing things in your name. By your spirit, we have done amazing things as the church, but there is still so much to do. And there is no reason that we shouldn't be able to reach these last 7,000 people groups in no time. If the 2.5 million of us will die to self and go across the world or go across the street and share this beautiful good news. Oh Lord. Forgive us for where we have sinned, where we have fallen short, where we have gripped too tightly to the things of this world. And by your spirit, open our hands and help us to live for you. It's in Jesus' perfect and precious name that all God's people said.
Amen. All right, we're going to end with another short video that just talks about how this self-denial, it's, it's all about love. It's all about the love that, that we display from Jesus that he poured into us, that we then pour into others. Be blessed. I love you. Good night. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus is asked the question, which is the greatest commandment? He answered, love God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. And then again, at the Last Supper, he says the same thing, but with a twist, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples. This time, Jesus replaced your neighbor with one another. This new love that Christ commands of us goes much deeper than the Old Testament commandment he was quoting in Matthew. The people we have been commanded to love has expanded beyond our neighborhoods to include, well, everyone. And this includes people who might make this commandment a bit difficult, like that confrontational coworker who just seems impossible to get along with, or your in-laws who've never treated you like a part of the family, or maybe the person you just met who you don't even know and really need some help. You see, Jesus knew his physical time on earth was nearing an end. So in this new take on the old commandment, Jesus also made another change. The words as yourself became as I have loved you. Wow, that's a tough act to follow. Christ's sacrificial life provides a clear and concrete example of real and true love. And he put this love on display on a daily basis with his disciples. He was patient with them, speaking kindly and showing great concern for their welfare. He instructed, counseled, and comforted them, prayed with them and for them. He admonished them for wrongdoing and yet compassionately bore with their failings. And most of all, he gave his life, dying so that they and we might live. According to Jesus, this is how others will know that you are one of his followers, not because you have a shirt or a bumper sticker that says so, not because we announce it from a stage or a blog or a status update, but because they look at you, at how you live, the things you do and say, and they see Jesus. They see love.